look, we're at a CCO Club webinar of 90. We are so close to 100, and I promise for 100, we'll do something, a really great topic. Uh, so I look forward to hitting 100 with you tonight. We are going to talk about a question that was submitted to the CCO Club. It's how to code EKG diagnosis from the interpretation statement. Now, this is broad. So I thought we needed to first understand EKGs. What's the purpose? Uh, what information we get from EKGs and kind of break it down to their to the to the statements that uh, require us to eat to code for EKG. Now we will not be talking CPT codes here tonight. We will be talking the diagnosis codes and we're not even really going to talk about the codes per se because that is not what the question was. It's how do we do this? Are there any guidelines surrounding this? Is there any billing rules around this, etc.? So uh, again, let's backtrack. Let's talk about what EKGs are to begin with. And EKGs and ECGs are synonymous. Don't worry about that. And uh, I see some people coming through on our live events. Make sure that you say hello to everybody and you let us know where you're coming in from because I like seeing that out of the corner of my eye. We It's fun seeing uh, all over the United States and even outside of the United States. Also, real quick, don't forget uh, to do that thumbs up before the end of the event. That helps us. I'll remind you at the end, though. So let's get right into what EKGs are. They're electrocardiograms. And this is an extremely common test that can be done. It only takes a couple minutes. And in fact, it takes more time to put the leads on someone than it does to actually run the test itself. Um, but ultimately, it monitors the heart. We get to see the electrical current of the heart on that red graph strip. I'm going to show you several examples of those and what it looks like as to what the, where the interpretation usually is. So again, what, what do they do? It's usually used for if a person comes in with chest pain, why do they have chest pain? I think in a few lectures back, I may have mentioned that one time I had a chest pain that just kept coming and going, coming and going, but it would, it would be this really heaviness. And that's a sign that you are having some kind of a cardiac issue uh, because chest pain can be from esophagitis, it can be from muscle pain, sternal pain even, it can be your lungs, bronchitis, which I have asthma and bronchitis, uh, especially when I was younger. It can also be from the electrical current of your heart or a blockage. It, some of the other signs and symptoms is that you could get sweaty, you could uh, have pain that radiates down your left arm. And when you start telling people that you have heaviness in your chest, pain that radiates down your left arm and you're feeling sweaty and you just, you know, you're not feeling good and nothing seems to really alleviate it, you're headed to the ER. So I worked at the hospital. This had been coming and going for a while and, but I was young. I mean, I was in my thirties and in pretty good physical shape. But again, this seemed to come and go. And then one day it just got so bad that uh, I waited till I was done working. And I told my supervisor, I said, you know, I just don't feel good. And I said, now I'm breaking out in a sweat. And she said, we're going up to the ER. She took me up to the ER and I gave them the signs and symptoms. What did they do? They immediately hooked me up to the EKG machine. And what was funny because they ran it upside down. That was kind of humorous. I had to joke. It was a young tech guy that was in there. And when you have an EKG done on a woman, they have to, you know, um, they give you a gown to put on and they're, you know, have to look at your chest. So I think he was a little uncomfortable. But anyway, they were able to read it and immediately rule out any cardiac issues because I was I was fine. Come to find out, I went and saw the uh, gastroenterologist and I had burnt a hole in my uh, um, 
uh, esophagus from chewing up <laughs> ibuprofen like candy because I was having back pain, which I thought was back pain. It was really my kidneys. And so I was taking like 800 milligrams three or four times a day and even sometimes waking up in the night for like six months. And again, not a good thing. It took a year, almost two years for that to heal. But the pain and signs and symptoms were just like a person having a heart attack. How did they rule out those signs and symptoms immediately? EKG. And it will also tell you uh, if you're not only having chest pain, if you're having any type of heart related issues, it's going to pick that up. Uh, some other signs and symptoms being really tired, shortness of breath, dizziness, fainting. These can be signs of a cardiac issue, but they could also be signs of other things. So sometimes I would feel short of breath even because that pressure on my chest, because my esophagus, which it was so, you know, it's right there close to your heart anyway. And that's about where that that hole was. And it was swollen and irritated and uh, uh, just made it hard to breathe with that pressure. And then also uh, it will show irregular heartbeats. Kind of fine tuning that to the signs and symptoms that you're going to see in documentation. And that's what we want to look at is what documentation are we going to see associated to a cardiac issue that would mean that they're going to do an EKG right away. Uh, now, there is two types, you know, they can do screening or diagnostic. And we're going to look at diagnostic, not necessarily screening. So again, chest pain, we already went over that. Dizziness, lightheadedness, or confusion. We don't want to forget that. If there's not enough blood getting to the right place in the heart, or if there's a blockage, uh, that could cause us to have not good oxygenated blood to the to the brain even. And so heart palpitations would be a sign of an irregular rhythm, a rapid pulse. Now, we've all probably had that. You may have even had palpitations where you all of a sudden your heart raced a little bit. If I drink too much coffee, which I very seldom ever drink coffee, I've only in my 50s, um, 53, so acquired a taste for coffee, but I can't drink a cup of coffee without having my chest go. Duh, 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 duh. So if I order some kind of little fancy drink, I always tell them, don't put very much coffee in there, just enough to flavor it to, you know, I, I'm in for the mostly the, the milky gooey stuff that makes it taste so wonderful. Uh, again, I could maybe do one day of having a drink like that. But if I were to do two in a row, that next day, I would just have heart palpitations throughout the rest of the day because I just don't take in caffeine. And that is something I'm not used to. There's no cardiac issue. It's just you're getting too much of a stimulant that you're not used to. Now, people that drink coffee every day, it, they're not going to have that issue. They may actually have issues if they don't get coffee, right? So it it's not necessarily the heart that's the problem. It's the... the um, it's the chemical that you're putting in your body or drugs, different types of drugs can cause these signs and symptoms as well. There are uh, types of drugs that are stimulants and depressants, right? Uh, so rapid pulse, I've had that before where my blood pressure would, would be low, but my pulse would just really race and shortness of breath, SOB, weakness, fatigue, or decline in ability to exercise. Now that ladder is is telling. Now we can all be feeling a little weak or tired, especially this time of year. I think it has a lot to do with, we just don't get enough vitamin D and sun as we do in the summer. So there's that change in the tilt of the earth. And as the seasons change and we're getting into um, this time of year while we're doing this recording, it is a uh, fall and getting ready for winter uh, versus being in the summertime where you get lots of that good vitamin D from the sun. Lack of vitamin D can cause a lot of these symptoms as well. And by far, nowadays versus 50 years ago, probably even 20 years ago, we don't get 
as a society the vitamin D that we used to. We we work a lot more inside than we used to. And even our children, I know when my kids would go to the pediatrician, uh, uh, one told me one time that we we just, children are lacking in vitamin D as a standard now, which was really shocking. Because again, they you can probably remember, we were outside playing all the time because once Saturday cartoons were over, you're done. You you get kicked out of the house. Or when you came home from school, you put your stuff down, you maybe did your homework, and then your parents kicked you out of the house and you played all night until it was time to come in for supper. And children just don't do that like we used to. And therefore, we're lacking in vitamin D. Or it could be genetic where your, uh, my husband, his whole side of his family uh, on his mother's side and him and some of my children are, uh, I guess you could say, predisposed to having low levels of vitamin D. Didn't matter what they were doing. It's just it ran in the family that they had very, very low, they had to have supplements of vitamin D. Again, all of this is because you're lacking a chemical or mineral can cause these signs and symptoms. And all the other ones that we've talked about could be a reason to have an EKG done. The benefit is the e of the EKG is that instantly we can tell if it's a cardiac issue or not. It's like an instant little window into the heart and it will red flag right away if further testing needs to be done. So what actually does the EKG look at? And this is stuff we probably don't know that much about. Now, I have, I thought EKGs were really fascinating, even all those like 30 years ago, more than 30, I'll say 35. Uh, I got to, as a very, very young, at 18, I got to start working in the ER. And EKGs just were this amazing type of science. I was so fascinated with them. But at that time, I really didn't understand what they did exactly, what they traced. So through the years, I've gone back and kind of studied a little more. But my understanding is very, very nil. That doesn't mean if you're interested in it, you can't do more research on your own. And providers love to talk about this kind of thing. So at the end of this slide deck, there is a resource page, and I used a lot of resources for tonight. So I encourage you to go and look at those resources and several sites that I used really in-depth explain every one of these uh, seven steps and more and lots of pictures, which I'm going to show you some tonight. So again, if that's something that's fascinating to you, I, I encourage you to look into it. And, uh, uh, you know, you may never be called to that. And, and if you're a coder, uh, biller, auditor, you know, type thing, that this isn't going to be something you're going to be called to do. But doesn't it make it us better at our jobs if we understand the process and the disease process that goes along with it? So the first thing that an EKG can do is it's going to look at the heart rate itself. That's very telling if something's going wrong. The heart rate and the rhythm. So how fast is the heart working? And do we have a good sinus rhythm? And I think I've told you before, if you guys have seen some of the other uh, presentations that we've done, you know, your heart's got that lub-dub uh, atmosphere to it, you know, lub-dub, lub-dub, and it should be very, very smooth. Uh, if you don't have a uh, stethoscope, I encourage you, they're not that expensive. You can get some inexpensive ones now. Uh, I remember I had a really, really expensive one when I started nursing school that I saved and saved for and then ultimately when I quit going to nursing school and went a different way my husband would use it in his uh, con contracting business and he would listen to walls for water leak and it just kind of made me sick that he was using that high dollar stethoscope and he said it works better than anything else and so uh, again <laughs> no, that was kind of funny so we have a lub dub it should be that even lub dub lub dub lub dub so if we have too fast of a rate or too slow it's going to go lub dub lub dub lub or it's going to be even slower and um, our rhythm we want it to go lub dub not lub lub dub or lub dub dub lub dub you know what i mean you can go out also and listen on youtube at different 
rhythms of the heart and what they mean. That's really fascinating. So they can tell you what a murmur sounds like and they explain it a little bit. Again, that's a lot of fun. Also, uh, a little sidetrack, go out and listen to the lung sounds. You won't know, need to know this necessarily, the rhythm of the heart, unless you're going to become a clinician. But your understanding of this, you're just having a little bit of a basic skill set under your belt will make it easier when you go to read the documentation. And it your your brain won't have to take up those few extra steps saying oh yeah what was afib again no no i know exactly what afib was and uh new words and verbiage kind of slow you down so electrical heart axis uh, and that's kind of like the axis of the uh, from pole to pole in the planet uh the PR intervals, which I'm going to explain that a little bit more in depth on the next slide. I broke it down. QRS complex. Now, these are all initials that tell different peaks and waves of the heart rhythm. Uh, you don't have to have those memorized, but you may hear people talk about the P wave or the QP wave, etc. Repolarization as well as the uh, RS ratio. So what do some of these uh, mean that we may not be familiar with? I pulled this off of a educational site for physician's assistants and it was saying, you know, a, a normal PR interval range is going to be uh, 120 to 200 and that if it's over 200, then you've probably got a first degree AV block. So what do you think AV stands for when it says an AV block? Go ahead and put that in the chat. I'm curious how many of you guys know. If you've watched some of our lectures, like last week, I think I uh, had two different events that we talked about AV. And so I'm curious what you're going to say. So if you have a first degree AV block, then notice it says uh, that each P wave is followed by a QRX complex. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Second degree block and these Morbitz and Winklebach, those are usually named after a provider. Uh, yes, arterial ventricle. Yes, very good. Very good, guys. So Rio, uh, Kathy, Donna, you nailed it. And uh, what is a, another AV? Is there anything else? There's an AV node and an SA node, right, in the heart that does the electrical current at the top of the heart and at the bottom of the heart, right? And AV is anterior ventricle, you know, so that's cool. So we got a second degree AV block, and then it says a third degree AV block. What are they looking for? for when they and again it, it kind of explains it now we don't need to know that we you know they're not going to see say it's a it's a Mobitz 2 da, 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 da. no they'll say it's a second degree AV block or you know uh, when you look at that in the documentation so I just put that in there for you just kind of give you a background knowledge uh, we always like increasing our knowledge base don't we this is what afib looks like now this is a pretty intense afib sometimes i don't think that it's quite as distinctive as that but you can go out and see lots of these ekg strips of afib and a flutter uh, it's a good idea to know the difference between uh, afib and a flutter we've talked about that recently i know uh, ultimately it's we're looking for an arrhythmia which is just an abnormal heart rhythm it uh, afib uh, and a flutter uh, six sinus syndrome you may uh, sss uh, they're not going to say six sinus syndrome they're going to just say sss uh, little stuff like that they can also see on these strips if you have CAD. Car, uh, uh, you know what? Put on there what CAD is. How many of you guys know that? Because we recently did a, a lecture on that and I see some names that uh, are, are visiting these YouTube uh, lectures a lot and also LinkedIn and Facebook, but I see some new names too. So CAD pop up there what CAD is. One that really fascinates me though 
is an old MI. You got it, Kathy. You got it, Zolma, Donna, Kim. You're right. Uh, coronary artery disease. And we know that coronary artery disease is like the top three of uh, uh, killing diseases for the U.S. Thank you very much. But the old MI, how fascinating is that? So I... Uh, always talk about my family. Uh, I remember that here a while back, my mother-in-law had to have something done. And uh, I think it was just her normal uh, annual wellness visit, maybe. And she said, she said, the doctor said I had an old MI. She goes, I don't remember ever having a heart attack. And uh, no, she said, what is that? And I said, well, it's a, it's a heart attack. And she said, I've never had a heart attack. And I said, well, heart attack isn't always what they you see on TV. An MI is a myocardial infarction. It, it's a little blockage that damages the heart and it can be, fr it, it's an obstruction and that could uh, bust up itself. Uh, you, you may just have some discomfort for a little while and not know that you've had an MI uh, or your um, it's the heart doesn't heal itself and that's why they can see that damage in the rhythm isn't that amazing that they're able to tell that now they just know that it happened a long time you know probably a long time ago if you've not had any signs and symptoms and of course you know at that time I can't even remember how old she was but uh, again just the fact that if you've had damage to the heart in the past, that means your heart, because it can't regenerate itself, is going to have damage in forever, right? Now, the rest of the heart, just like the brain, which doesn't rejuvenate itself, the, those uh, cells and that organ can kind of compensate after a while. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, you or you, if you have a massive MI and it's, corrected, it takes a long time to recover from that. Now, another thing that it looks for is how is your heart assistive devices that you have working? So we're checking on a pacemaker. Is your pacemaker working okay? You may have a watchman's device. If you don't know what that is, we've done a lecture on that in the past. You might uh, do a search on our YouTube channel to look for that. But uh, And that's a fascinating thing that they can do now. Uh, but we want to see that a rhythm is staying pertinent and helpful that we don't have any problems with the pacemaker itself. So one arrhythmia that's very common that you'll see documented a lot, especially in our geriatric patients, is AFib. And ultimately, you get out of rhythm when you age. Your heart and your your uh, cardiovascular system gets you know wear and tear on it through the years. Now we're going to look at some examples of EKGs. This is a... Uh, plain Jane 12 lead EKG and notice that uh, this, is, this is pretty much the format that you're going to see. Uh, you'll have the information about the patient on the left. Of course we have no name and stuff but they'll have like a patient ID number, MRN number and so this patient's 39 years old. They're a female. They're 5'6 and they weigh 170 pounds. And then it would list. Did it have any medications? So why is it why is it important to for the person that's reading the EKG to know if this person has any medications uh, that they take on a regular basis? Go ahead and put in the chat what you think that would be. And then their blood pressure. And then it goes on to divide up. Look the HR, the the RR, the the P, the PR, the QRS, and all this information. And then you notice in that box, where you see that box that it says example of a complete 12 lead EKG, a lot of times the formatting will give you the diagnosis right there. Sometimes it's in the middle of that information. And, and again, it's uh, uh, different formats, you know, but for the most part, it's going to be in, in the middle at the top or uh, off to the right at the top. It's just general format. And they always look like this. Now, if you see that single strip, that's like a um, mobile EKG uh, thing that comes out and it gives you one strip and a lot of times that's the the type that you see uh, used to see on the nursing floor and they would take multiple of those and cut them and lay them on a page so when the doctor flipped through he could see all the pages and pages of EKG 
G. Okay, so Donna said because the medicine could affect the rate and rhythm. Eileen, because the this way they can get them the right med, yes, and uh, it affects the treatment, Sharon said. All of those are absolutely right. So if you have a patient that's on aspirin, it's usually because of some type, they're, they're wanting to thin the blood. So that leads my brain to think there's some type of cardiac issue going on. Are they on Lipitor? Well, that's for hyperlipidemia, uh, but if you have clogging of the arteries and stuff, then you're going to have heart issues. Uh, maybe you are on a medication that helps with AFib itself. So your knowledge of medications will help you. And that's what the doctor's looking at. Uh, everything that you guys say, uh, Leah says, check the arrhythmias um, threaten. Yes, absolutely. So this is what it kind of looks like uh, when it's just a plain one and we're going to move on. Look at this one. Okay, when you go to look at the resources, these next few that I grabbed were a uh, a study that was done on computer generated EKGs and their accuracy levels and uh, if we were able to read EKGs uh, underneath all of those it kind of said okay these are the things that the machine missed the computer generated uh, missed in these but this is what it said you know so this particular patient it uh, stated that they've got sinus bradycardia, left axle deviation, atypical bundle branch block. Uh, so real quick, what is a, uh, what's bradycardia? So go ahead and put that in there. Oh, Zorelto, that's right, Eileen. You're right, Zorelto. That's one that you see advertised on TV all the time. Mm. So again, now left axis deviation, there's not a code for that, but there is for uh, bradycardia, and there's also for a bundle branch block, and they will probably tell you what um, the um, uh, more information on that. So yes, you guys are all right. Uh, slow heartbeat. Uh, oh gosh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce your name right. Gear three. G no, gay. Gayothry. <laughs> That's what I'm going with. Um, uh, so Donna, uh, right, Kathy, Rio, Eileen, Juliet, all slow. I used to remember that. And when I would teach my students, I'd say, you know, we used to watch the Brady Bunch. That's old and slow compared to shows now. So bradycardia is slow. Then what's the opposite would be tachycardia. And if you're fast, you're tacky, right? You're doing, whatever you're doing is probably tacky work. And so tack is fast, Brady, Brady Bunch is slow. Atypical bundle branch block, atypical means that it's abnormal, okay? And so this is what a computer generated look of that would be that bundle branch, block abnormality and bradycardia, the slow. And that's because you're seeing uh, too much space on the left, too much space between those peaks that you see. Let's look at this one. Uh, it is also, all these are computer generated interpretations. Instead of the provider putting in that information, the computer is sensing it. And Ultimately, we'll talk a little bit about that more. This one is irregular rhythm because we know that's one of the things that our EKGs tell us. No detected P wave. That's, you got to have all the points, all the, the areas. So we had the P, the R, the Q, right? R, S. We, we have to have all of those uh, peaks, diffs and stuff. So the fact that they don't have a P wave, very telling. Something's not right. And ventricular beats. Um, uh, I don't know what that is. Bigamony? Uh, oh, wait, I'll have to look that up. I didn't pay attention. So again, we can see the difference between this rhythm and EKG versus the one that we just previously looked at. Mom has 40 beats per minute. That is slow. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yep, that would be 
slow heart uh, two PV uh, CS. Yep. Okay. So what does this one look like? We got uh, AFib and we've got a normal QRS access and we have incomplete right bundle branch block. Remember when we looked at uh, a couple before and it said atypical bundle branch block and I said when they write out the interpretation, it'll probably give us more information than just atypical. And in this one, it's incomplete right bundle branch block. And there's different codes for that. So that's why we want to always get to the highest specificity. Sometimes we will have an abnormal rhythm, but without that EKG report and the interpretation, we can't get to the highest specificity for the diagnosis code. And our providers don't always know if they're called to pull those codes off of the uh, whatever program they're using, like Cerner or Epic and things. They don't necessarily know how detailed you can actually get. So that's pretty, um, pretty interesting. We have AFib. So we have an abnormal rhythm. And, and really, look over there on the left. So we have that. We kind we we're supposed to have a little bitty hump at the beginning, and we kind of do, and we've got the sharp peak. But when it drops down, look at that little little squiggle before it starts to come back up. That's not normal. And then when it gets to the point where it comes back up, you see a squiggle again. Those aren't supposed to be there, right? Look at the comparison on the other side. That is more typical of what we should be seeing. No little squiggles like we're having an earthquake. No, we want nice humps and sharp peaks going down and up and then a little hump. And uh, it should be very uh, ryth rhythmic and, it, uh, and uniform. Uh, let's see, Tina says, when I was working in the hospital, we called the auto written interpretation, the doc in the box. I like that. I, I, now that you say that, that kind of reads for me a little bit. And when you're working in the hospital and, you know, maybe you, nurses are pretty clever with these. They see these all the time. They have access to the provider to give them more information, especially if you've got cardiac nurses. You know, they're savvy. But as soon as you know that something's off and what the specificity of what is being off by the computer generated, then you're out calling that doctor when you're in-house um, uh, an in-house clinician and you said, hey, we, you know, our patients in AFib and they weren't, you know, or uh, uh, things like that. And then uh, again, you know, you, you've got a heads up. You don't have to worry about you being able to see something. The computer picked it up really quickly and then the doctor could come in and look at it. They can even scan them and send, you know, tell them, hey, the EKG strips up there, go look at it. And then the doctor can onboard the treatment medication or whatever right away. So let's move and look at the other one. This one has a sinus rhythm. That sinus rhythm is a good thing. That's what it's called when you have a nice sinus rhythm. First degree AV block. So that's not good though. And then we have an extreme, extreme right axis deviation, a left ventricular hypertrophy with ST and T abnormalities. So again, we've identified the AV block and we have the ST and T abnormalities. These are peaks, right? Uh, now look, look at the difference that we have here. One thing we're seeing is uh, when we get into that first uh, part. Now, don't, don't pay attention to that solid black line that's in there. That's, that's just a staging thing. But we we we've got these peaks that are dropping and then we're not going up right we're not doing our little humps we're, we're not going down we're not going up and we're not rhythmic and we've got little uh, earthquakes going on and i'm still just looking at the left right and so and the right is just a hot mess but every single one of these is sh indicating something very very specific and when the providers look at this we are able to to determine immediately what is uh, what's going on. So again, uh, let's move on. Yeah, Donna says, treat the patient, not the machine. That's right. That is absolutely right, Donna. 
So let's let's now let's go back. I've got an example uh, that we're going to go through. This is just some common diagnosis codes that are used to indicate why a person might have a an EKG done. Okay, this is not coding out the um, the AFib and and stuff. These are some unique diagnosis codes that. Uh, would lead to further information that was needed. So I-10, that is your hypertension. A person that has hypertension, we want to monitor that. We want to stay on top of it because not only is uh, can hypertension become chronic and if it's not managed, you ultimately wear the heart out. But hypertension is very, very hard on the kidneys. The That's why when you code, there's that causal relationship between hypertension and CKD. So if you have a CKD patient, they've got high blood pressure. In fact, that's sometimes one of the first things that says, hey, heads up, something's wrong with this guy. We have extreme hypertension. Uh, I'll use um, uh, my stepfather, for example, super healthy guy, and he's uh, turned 80, doing great, started having some headaches and feeling kind of off went to the doctor and his blood pressure was, you know, triple digits, uh, systolic and diastolic. And the doctor did an EKG and said, okay, that's fine. But he suspected something was wrong with the kidneys because this is a very healthy person, never taken any medicine and um, goes in and looks. And sure enough, the next day the labs come back and he has extreme CKD, sudden onset. So of course it, it, um, for someone to ha never have hypertension, then all of a sudden have extremely high hypertension or, or high blood pressure. Hypertension and high blood pressure is two separate things. So let me qualify that real quick. Uh, you know, and then they identify, hey, you, your kidney function, your GFR is bottomed out. You know, then again, they've got to figure out what the problem was. And they were, they were able to, to get his to start coming back up once they found out what the underlying cause was and he's doing great now. So hypertension or uh, extreme abnormal uh, blood pressure, big giveaway. Uh, Eileen says, my husband has hypertension, but thank goodness no CKD. Because if you treat hypertension, then it protects the kidneys. That's why you, um, if, if you have hypertension, you need to be on medication to keep those kidneys safe. All right, now the next code, R94, we have R94.31 and 0.4. Uh, one is abnormal EKG, and the next one is abnormal result of kidney function studies, GFR. Why is that pertinent? Because why I just told you the kidneys and the hypertension uh, and abnormal heart rhythm that all has a causal relationship. It indicates something's off. Our codes are signs and symptom codes, which leads the provider and statistically for us to jump to the next conclusion. We got to figure out why we have an abnormal EKG. You know, why do we have abnormal kidney function? Why are the kidneys stressed? Is it because of something to do with the heart? Uh, then, of course, uh, I25.2, old MI, and that's anything past that um, uh, eight weeks. Yeah, is it still eight weeks? They moved that a while back. You, uh, uh, there was six and there was eight and stuff, but yeah, I think it's eight weeks. Just let me know if if that is, it's eight weeks. Confirm in my brain. I don't know. I'm just going brain dead over that. Aline says it caused from hyperthyroidism. That's another issue, right? If you have some other chemical imbalance, because that's what hyperthyroidism is. A, it's an, a chemical imbalance due to that gland, the thyroid gland. It thyroid will mess you up. It will turn you into a hot mess over lots of things. So that's a great thing to study. Uh, it'll mess with your blood pressure. I can't even go into all the things it can mess with. Uh, you always want a very, very healthy thyroid. Now look at the T46.5 X6A under dosing of other uh, antihypertensive drug. An initial counter that's just the a at the end uh, so we are taking blood pressure medication and we don't we're not getting enough of it under dosing 
then we have Z91.120, patients uh, intentional underdosing of medication regime due to a financial hardship. This is this is something that is being tracked. Rio says four weeks. Thank you. It used to be eight weeks and now it's four weeks, right? So I kept thinking it's not six. You know how you little, you go brain dead every once in a while. Uh, that's that. And that is a very, very basic thing. You guys, if you don't have that written down and memorized, you need to write that down. Uh, uh, a, an MI after four weeks is uh, considered an old MI. Okay, 28 days. And another little pertinent information for you to know is statistically, if you're going to have a subsequent MI, it'll happen in those first four weeks. So little tidbit. Um, again, you need to just memorize that. All right, so the next one is Z01.810, accounted for pre-procedural cardiovascular examination. All of these are reasons to have an EKG and some diagnosis codes. These diagnoses will substantiate an EKG. I wanted to throw in some information about risk adjustment just because it was also in that article. And everybody knows that I love risk adjustment. That's my passion. Anytime I can get a chance to talk about risk adjustment, I'm going to do it. So again, risk adjustment. How does an EKG or those diagnoses involve risk adjustment? Ultimately, the Medicare and uh, uh, risk adjusts with it so they can financially plan based off of the uh, chronic conditions that a person has, ding, 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 AFib, uh, even hypertension uh, for their RxHCCs. Why? Because if we don't manage the hypertension, what happens? The kidneys can be damaged and that costs a lot more to take care of a patient that has uncontrolled hypertension and then results in kidney damage and CKD than it does to budget for making sure that patient can stay on their hypertension medication. So sometimes you have diagnoses that will risk adjust and uh, ultimately that's the purpose. So what are we looking for? Things like feigning, getting the scenario details and what's the chief complaint. Now, again, we're going to look at an HCC, um, we're going to look at a scenario, but it's not going to carry or be part of a CMS HCC, which is Medicare patients. Uh, the example that I found in another article was actually an athlete and uh, a younger person. So we're going to kind of go over it and see the setup of what an EKG can do when in uh, compiled with the scenario of a person going to the ER, right? Uh, because uh, EKGs are very, very common in the ER. Why? Because people go to the ER when something's wrong. And how are we going to figure out if the heart is involved? EKG right away. Okay. So uh, again, we are going to look at a patient that fainted. We're going to look at the scenario quickly and the chief complaint. And uh, the patient had dizziness and weakness, feeling tired last few days and reports passing out of school, out at school. This is not a Medicare patient, right? This is a healthy. So it would be if we went in with HCCs, uh, it's going to be a patient that would uh, be a uh, HH. SHCC, which is federally funded insurance uh, that is not Medicare. And now, according to the ACA, uh, just about everything risk adjusts because uh, most everything has a federally funded component to it. So here's the history. We're just going to go over this uh, a little bit and, and know that you guys can go in and uh, uh, read these slides. If you're in the club, you're going to be able to go back and and study these uh, a little more. But uh, the history is we've got a 20-year-old. Uh, he's an athlete. He's in college. He is healthy. No prior medical history. He does wrestling, cross-country running, uh, and then he's getting these signs and symptoms for the past couple days. Um, he uh, had three several second witnessed uh, fainting spells at school yesterday. He went to the clinic at the university and the uh, nurse checked him out. He didn't have palpitations, tachycardia, no blurred vision, and no prior episodes. 
uh, when he, the uh, he was questioned, then he stated that he was told he had to lose 11 pounds to be able to uh, wrestle in the uh, weight requirement that he wanted to be in. In other words, he was too big, so he's going to slim down real fast so that he can compete in that that field. And that's all based on weight. Um, you know, how big you are. So you're not going to have a giant 250-pound uh, guy wrestle a, um, you know, a, a much shorter 140 year, uh, 140 years, 140 pound person. It, it's not a fair match. So uh, what did he start doing to drop that 11 pounds? He, um, uh, he bumped up his cards. He tried to dehydrate himself, he exercised a lot, and he even started purging, uh, which means that you would eat a lot and then throw up. Uh, no medications or allergies, he doesn't use any supplements, uh, or diuretic use, which is good because a lot of times they'll do that. To Everybody knows water weight, you can drop a man can drop 10 pounds easily in water weight in a few days. Women know men can. It's just a fact uh, about the way their bodies are made up. So uh, the exam, the exam portion, he looks exhausted. He has no apparent um, distress, but he's afibra, uh, orthostatic, the, nothing was uh, there. Uh, his lying BP is 116 over 78. His heart rate is 56. Sitting. 107 over 60, uh, heart rate 74, but get this, standing 92 over 49, and this is not 1,100, uh, <laughs> 123, um, that three at the end of the, uh, that was where they were listing, did you notice on like the purging said two, these are, uh, was like one, two, three, where it could, could grab it, I should have taken that off. So again, the heart rate isn't over a thousand, thank goodness. Uh, so then mucous membranes are pale, skin's dry, turgor, um, and uh, tinting, meaning when they do this, it means he's dehydrated. Capillary refills good, uh, chest is clear, heart sounds are normal, labs significant for creatine, uh, his BUN and his glucose are checked, and EKG shows sinus tachycardia. So what do we know? He has a fast heartbeat. Now, uh, you normal athletic uh, uh, athletes don't. They may have a little bit faster, and they sometimes have a lower blood pressure. Uh, the but uh, again, and and that happens with younger people too. So he's twenty years old, and he. You know, but notice the lying, sitting, and standing blood pressures. When people pass out, that's one of the things they want to do is they want to know if it has anything to do with, like, say, POT syndrome or uh, orthostatic uh, hypertension. You know, why uh, you should predominantly have a very similar blood pressure in all three. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll have you lay down for a few minutes uh, or 10 minutes. And they'll check your blood pressure. Then they'll have you sit for like five or 10 minutes. They'll go take it again. Then they'll have you stand up. And it should be the same if you've had uh, a chance to regulate, right? So if you get up real fast and they take your blood pressure immediately, of course, that's going to be off a little bit. So uh, yeah, Donna said that is uh, po uh, postural hypotension. Yes, that is correct. All right. So now we know they did an EKG and it was to rule out anything wrong with the heart causing this. But in fact, we see that he has a fast heartbeat, which should not be happening to an athlete. And there are several reasons for a fast heartbeat in a normally healthy person. Uh, uh, and we're going to look at those. So what's the uh, assessment and plan? We have orthostatic intolerance. Thus, it's he, they said, so this is not something that they just have. I'm sure the patient doesn't have POT syndrome or anything, but it's likely secondary to hypotension, low blood pressure. He's dehydrated and he has hypovolemia, which means he's dehydrated himself to the point where he just doesn't have enough blood and fluid in his body, period, hypovolemia. He is low on 
volume of liquid that his body needs to function properly and therefore he passes out so what are they going to do they're going to uh, give him two liters of I, uh, iv normal saline in the office and he's uh, um, it, he said and it uh, resolves the orthostasis and the tachycardia so uh, again he his blood pressure will even out in those three positions and his heart rate will slow down uh, he's also going to uh, see a, a nutritionist to talk about what his body needs as an athlete to be able to uh, keep up with what he needs to do and the fact that he admitted to purging um, he could potentially have bulimia and we think sometimes that bulimia is a female uh, disease but it's not and the fact is is a lot of athletes male and female when they're uh, required to change their weight end up having eating disorders it's it's actually very very common with a athletics and you don't necessarily think that it's not a self-esteem or anything it's just trying to be the best they can and doing whatever they can they get obsessed uh, there are there a lot of athletes are control freaks and if you can't control everything else at least you can control your body and that's where some of this this happens and then they fall into a trap and then pretty soon it becomes a psychological issue uh, as well as a physical issue. Uh, let's see, Elaine says, mine is like this and I need to go with the kidneys. Yes, absolutely. The kidney specialist will really pay attention to orthostatic intolerance as well as uh, anything that has to do with the heart. That Those two, cardiology and uh, nephrology work hand in hand together. Uh, they're going to recommend psychological content uh, uh, consultation and he's going to follow him up in two weeks and um, make sure that it this resolves it because if it doesn't there could be something else going on. Now again all the signs and symptoms and the testing and the questioning everything is saying hey this normal healthy athlete has more or less kind of done this to themselves if we take care of the signs and symptoms then these diagnoses will resolve themselves and these diagnoses are treatable you know and we don't need to use medication uh, uh, however if in two weeks the this athlete is still having these issues then are they not following the recommendations are they still purging are they still not eating correctly um, uh, you know, or is there something else going on like hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, you know, m maybe there's something else, uh, a glandular issue of some kind or whatever. So the, it's a launching point that EKG will lead them to other things. So clinical documentation, this is just the thought process that you'll see in the documentation for the provider that will show why this EKG is able to rule out several things. And um, we can go over this a little bit, but I mostly put this in here, especially if you have to do provider education and you need some examples of verbiage or how to get that thought process of your provider. They're thinking all of this stuff and several things that we talked about, but they don't get it on paper. And so therefore it goes nowhere. And this is a big deal, especially in risk adjustment, but you got to support those codes that are pulled. So again, the, the etiologies, meaning the reasons for this fainting and, and passing out is multifactorial uh, and the documentation is very clear as to, hey, what is the reason? What are we doing to treat it? And what's the thought process? Um, uh, the purging behavior is mentioned and ultimately because the patient needs to lose 11 pounds. The hypotension, the orthostatic hypotension, uh, clear documentation to state that it's orthostatic hypotension because if they just put hypotension, then it's I10. Hi orthostatic hypertension is something completely different. It's a different diagnosis. And then link that to the dehydration and the hypovolemia, which are causes of those uh, orthostatic hypotension or it could be something else like 
pot syndrome and then uh, again that they were able to give the treatment, the standard treatment, onboarding um, some saline, normal saline, IV, push it through uh, quickly and get that, that fella uh, volume back up and they're dehydrated. And also, um, if the note is a standalone, then you need more details uh, to document the sinus tachycardia in there. So let's look at some EKG diagnoses that uh, that go along with this particular patient. What will we see? The, uh, and notice we've got two signs and symptoms code, R codes. We have one uh, ischemic code, which is the I code, and we have two E codes, which is metabolic and endocrine, right? So R55, we have uh, the syncope and collapse. The R00.0 is the tachycardia. The orthostatic hypertension is not I10, it's I95.1. Notice, this is how telling this is. I want you to pay attention to the code set itself. I10, that's at the very beginning of the I code range. And orthostatic hypotension is I95 all the way at the very end of the I co-ranges. That tells you how different they are, right? So uh, that's one of the cool things about our code set. E86.0 is dehydration and 0.1 is hypovolemia. And I just put this little uh, verbiage that came up on Phytocode about tachycardia and um, uh, just so you could add that to your knowledge base. For the most part, tachycardia is pretty harmless. We have tachycardia off and on, as well as uh, bradycardia throughout our lives for different reasons. And um, it usually just resolves itself normally. But if it's long standing, it could cause these other problems. Or you could have signs and symptoms that contribute to them. So, the question at the beginning is how do you code off an EKG? interpretation statement. Well, per CMS, and this is this particular patient that we looked at was actually a, a, a youth, so they would not be Medicare. Now we're going to kind of jump into the Medicare world, and which would also uh, involve us looking at the um, uh, HCCs that we mentioned, but per CMS, they have guidelines and it says that you can get reimbursed under Part B for Medicare for an EKG service if the physician or the incident uh, for the patient's services are approved, uh, are done by an approved laboratory, an approved supplier of a portable x ray service. Um, <clears throat> since there's no coverage for EKG services of any type rendered on a screening basis, why do you think that is? Why do you think they don't pay for EKG services for screenings? <coughs> Anybody got an idea? <coughs> Put that in there. Excuse me. Or part of a routine exam. So you have to have signs and symptoms or some other clinical reason to uh, necessitate the the service for an EKG. Sorry, guys. Right, Kathy, medical necessity is one. <clears throat> That's that is a good thought process. But let's let's break it down. What did we say at the very beginning about EKGs? Oh, Donna says too much abuse potential. Mm, yeah, there's that too. Fraud and abuse. Ultimately, it's because, guys, it's bundled in. It, it's so easy to do. It doesn't cost very much because EKG machines, now doctors have them in their offices. You know, it's, it's such a standard routine. It would be the uh, equivalent of saying, all right, I'm going to charge you to take your blood pressure or I'm going to charge you to take your temperature. No. <laughs> so think of that EKG on a screening or a routine exam as just part of the everyday bundled in uh, procedures that are done for screening and routine exams. 
So again, you they're not going to pay additionally for something that is uh, uh, basic. Now, that's screening and routine exam. That is not diagnostic. So what the difference would be is you have a patient with the signs and symptoms that we talked about. That's <clears throat> that EKG that was done on that young fella. That wasn't screening or routine. That was, um, it did have medical necessity. We had signs and symptoms and it's abnormal for a healthy uh, athlete to just pass out a few times a day, right? So again, that would get paid for by the, uh, the payers. Okay. It's not routine um, uh, exam and it's not a screening. It's diagnostic. So make sure you understand the difference between screening and diagnostic. We, that's pretty basic, simple stuff. No payment is made for an EKG interpretation by individuals other than physicians. Ah. So again, the clinician cannot do that. And that also means the nurse practitioner and the PA, these are approved CMS providers, but they cannot interpret EKGs. And that also means computers. It's got to be the physician. So then the next note says computer interpretations of EKGs is recognized as a valid and effective technique which will improve the quality and available availability of cardiology services. However, it's not a physician, so they won't read it or they won't uh, approve it. So they can't just say, oh, yeah, the computer did it. The physician has to write out the interpretation. So for you to be reimbursed for an EKG, uh, computer services, uh, whenever they do them, require other uh uh, coverage of other electrocardiographic services and that means they have to have the interpretation of the provider and they can't just have that computer generated one where the computer gives the EKG at the top now that can be submitted and in the record and it is however if the uh, person who interprets it they can also type in underneath that and give their interpretation and then it's signed electronically by that provider doctor feel good you know um, uh, md uh, e-signature cardiology department blah 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 you know read and said afib and st wave abnormality blah 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 okay so again that's different that can still be on that EKG strip, but ultimately with that EKG strip will come a report or it will be in the, the medical record note, the ER note, something where the interpretation from the provider is written in, okay? And they'll reference the EKG strip and the EKG, uh, for me, they can have all that information in there, but you have to go by what the provider states not that box that is computer generated and they they have to be electronically signed on the EKG strip usually now some programs are different don't don't um, come back and say well ours the hospital don't do that so you said that wrong again they're all different it, it I have seen them where it has the list of just like we were looking at that has the list of what the computer said, but then the official diagnoses are written at the top and there could be one, two, three, four, or things ruled out and then it's electronically signed on that EK tree strip uh, at the top. Uh, and then usually uh, it has to be uh, in the documentation of the assessment and plan also just depends what your rules and regulations are for wherever you work. Um, Jane says lab tests are hard to code. When do lab tests um, uh, for so many things if the doc's not clear in his order so you look at results from labs to code properly. Is this wrong? Yeah, we'll talk about that at the end uh, because it's true. 
there, there's some things that you've got to do that. And there's certain rules depending on why you're coding. Are you doing inpatient, outpatient? Are you doing risk adjustment? Things like that. Uh, Jane went on to say, I heard if doctor does an EKG like two in 10 hours, doc must tell why the EKG was done again and add a modifier 91. Uh, right, uh, if you want to be reimbursed for having an EKG more than one time in a day, then you better explain why. Uh, because they're just going to kick that out. Uh, if it's continual monitoring and stuff like that. Yes, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so we covered that. Let's go on. Oh, now we're here for the questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was good timing. So uh, let's go back. Lab tests are hard to code. When do lab tests for so many things? Uh, well, there's lab tests for so many things. Absolutely. If the doc's not clear in his orders, uh, so you look at the results from the lab to code properly. Is this wrong? Yes. Okay. You are not allowed to code off of lab reports. You can use the lab reports for several reasons. First of all, you get to bill for a lab, right? Uh, sometimes they're bundled in or panels and things like that. But you have to have a diagnosis to substantiate and show medical decision making why that lab was run. Now notice in our young fella, we had um, his BUN, his creatine, and something else was run, uh, maybe his GFR, I can't remember. Uh, so uh, what was the medical necessity? Well, everything that he had going on constituted uh, reasons to rule out or define, hey, is this a cardiac issue or is it? a uh, kidney issue or is this an imbalance like dehydration and stuff because dehydration and hypovolemia show up in those labs as well as for kidney function and um, uh, having that EKG. So can you code off of a lab? Absolutely not. Can you look at a lab result and where it says the H for high or the L for low and you see that the patient's GFR is off the wall and you know the range for CKD3, uh, CKD3A and you know that GFR meets, meets that standard and the doctor did not say, he just said the patient had CKD and what level? Can you look at that and say, yeah, he's a... Uh, uh, N18.3 uh, 1 for you know or uh, or versus an N18.9 uh, no you cannot you can't even if you know the information because then you are coding off the lab so the proper thing to do in those scenarios is you would query the provider and you would let the provider know because there's rules to query you would let the the provider know that the lab result showed X Y Z, and that uh, that uh, that gave specificity for the stage of CKD, and then you could do like, uh, you know, do you want um, it to be CKD uh, three four? five, you know, or give them a list and then they can click it off or, or whatever, you know, there's rules and regs as to way to do that. So you've noticed, you know that there's some, there's specificity there. It's not a CKD and specified. You have specificity because you saw it in the lab, but you, maybe the provider doesn't even know that there's specificity in it, right? So what you would do is you would just bring it to their attention and have them direct you as to what level it is. And they'd say, okay, well, they're, uh, C, uh, they are a stage three. And then you make sure you say, okay, well, now we have 3A and 3B, you know, or just say, no, they're a CKD2. Oh, okay. You know, uh, what stage? And then, uh, then you might even throw in there, you know, educate me on blah, blah, blah. It, they always like that. So, our role ends up being that provider educator. Sometimes they just don't know there's codes available for it because that's not their job to know. And that's why they rely on you. Or maybe they hadn't seen the, spec the lab yet. And that's why they knew that the patient had CKD, but they didn't have specificity because the lab wasn't available to them when they dropped that diagnosis. And now the lab is there and you can bring that to their attention. You know, there's all kinds of rules. Now, you, what if you say, wait a minute, I have no access to the provider. 
then what do I do? You know, you're, or, or uh, even in risk adjustment. Now, if you're in risk adjustment, you are out of luck unless you have rules that allow you to link. So it depends who you're working for. Risk adjustment, there's several areas uh, and reasons for risk adjustment. Uh, so whatever I take tell you, you can, there may be certain compliance rules within your department that might question that. But ultimately, you can only see that the lab was done. You can't take any of that information and bring that to a higher specificity in the code. It has to be documented by the provider in the encounter note. Can they reference the lab? Absolutely. Can you bring to their attention in a proper query that's not leading that that is available? Absolutely, you can. So would you query and make the doctor state it in the reply? There is, Deborah, there's protocol for queries and there are, it, depending on whether you're outpatient, inpatient, again, you know, risk adjustment, all these different worlds. So there will be a query protocol for wherever you work and you need to know what that is if you're a coder. Uh, but what you would do is um, have the doctor, yes, put it in the reply and uh, so that you can get to the highest specificity for that now. And maybe even there's ways to do addendums or to add the information and stuff like that. So again, that's going on to compliance. Uh, making them aware is what, probably our number one thing that we do now is letting them know what's available. How, let's see, Leah says, how do we inquire to the doctor for the medical necessity if the doctor's advised a group of lab, advised a group of lab if not all the tests are required? Well, they have to put their thought process there. It may not be that it's required, but again, what's their thought process as to why they wanted that lab? Now, we may think that there's not medical necessity behind it, and it could be just our uh, lack of knowledge in that area, but that's one of the things that we also do as coders is to educate the, the documentation that's needed to show medical necessity, which is also getting their thought process down on paper uh, for them. That stuff's all in their head. And, and again, they, um, they, may they may be thinking uh, a cancer diagnosis, like, man, we've got to rule this out. Or uh, maybe with our scenario, uh, <clears throat> maybe they're actually something that did show up in the EKG. So the provider says, you know what, we're going to do a full panel workup for X, you know, and you're thinking, uh, and for the payer, they're saying, well, okay, you've got an athlete, 20 years old, and so they passed out a couple times, and, you know, no, but the EKG showed this, and uh, therefore, I'm going to check their thyroid, their adrenal glands, their, you know, blah, 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 because uh, of this particular, you know, again, they have to put that thought process or... It, it's thrown out to the, the think and ink. Yes, Kathy, that's really, really good. You think and ink. And it's not easy for them. That's why having a scribe is really good for some of these providers because they are writing down, you know, they're documenting everything that that provider is stating and questions that they're asking and stuff like that. Whereas when the doctor steps back and they're typing all this stuff in either with the, the patient or afterwards, that thought process gets skipped. Jane says, patient comes in for a new fracture care, doc gets urine and blood, lab orders, lipid, urinal, pr prostate urinalysis in order for uh, order on the medical record, but the diagnosis of fracture doesn't match the lab, so query them. Um, yeah, if there's nothing that shows medical necessity. Now, think about this. We don't know the information about the patient. Is this a possible pathological fracture that the provider is thinking? Is this this 20-year-old athlete that comes in for a fracture? Or is this a, you know, 85-year-old patient with a past history of um, prostate cancer that maybe has metastasized to the bone? so it's a pathological fracture, then yeah, they're going to run the gamut to rule these things out. So again, the thought process still has to be written down. What do we have our 20-year-old that's, 
you know, uh, again, all these, the same guy that we just talked about, no cardiac issue, but the provider sees something that's like, wait a minute, something's not quite right. Or maybe he passed out and he got, he, he broke something. He was like, oh, well, he passed out, you know, what, twice, three times today, you know, and yeah, so the result of the fracture got him to the ER, not the passing out and all this stuff is coming. Then they might run more tests and stuff. So again, the thought process has to be um, looked at. And it says, if a patient has CAD post status cabbage, do we use Z code or the I25 code? Well, if they have I well, okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were saying I25 for the old MI. No, you, um, it depends what type of uh, CKD they do. You, you would let them, you, you could do, you could do both. Uh, so we've, I've done, I've worked with this before. We've done some um, other lectures on how to code out a patient. Just note that if they've had a cabbage and they have CAD, then it's the new vessels, or the, the provider has to distinguish, is this the new bypassed vessels that have, you know, disease now or causing blockages, or is this the uh, natural vessel, right? The native artery is what they call. So that has to be all explained, yeah. Uh, let's see, yes, thank you, Nick, is right, because coding is a four-leg stool, clinical care documentation, coding, and billing. Jane, I don't know where you heard that, but uh, give us permission to use that example. I'd love to find a graphic of a, a four-legged stool and use that. That's good. Uh, let's see. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. I, You know what? I ran over. I'm over an hour. And so I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, I appreciate you staying with us. Don't forget that you can join the club if you want access to this uh, slide deck, all of the resources that I've got listed there, and uh, the lecture. Uh, transcript and the continued conversation it's a minimal cost every month and we have this is this this question that we discussed tonight is straight from um, one of the people that had been on the lecture thank you Jane for the compliment <laughs> I appreciate it. you can tell I really like ICD so uh, anytime you ask a question on that I'm going to jump on it and so I appreciate you guys don't forget to say thumbs up right? Uh, let us know that this is a valuable content for you so that we get pushed up on um, the YouTube and LinkedIn as well all, uh, and Facebook. But you feel free to share this content. We are pumping this out free because we know it's valuable and we want people to uh, be knowledgeable. Uh, if you want to be notified of other events, we usually always do Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, as long as I have a voice. <laughs> and you can go to cco.us forward slash notify. Or if you're a YouTube person, click that little bell and it'll give you a heads up. Uh, risk coder here. Love ICD. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy Rose. Like minded. I know a lot of you guys are. Uh, ICD is just fabulous. Now, there's a lot of people that like CPT and I have a lot of respect for them. It just doesn't have that same disease process um, aspect and uh, but again good stuff thank you guys and let's see there's our references don't forget check out the CCO club come in make comments we can carry this conversation over I'd love to hear some insights and some examples or finish talking in Facebook LinkedIn and YouTube uh, carry the conversation on you know we we check in on there uh, pretty often but uh, again you're gonna have more conversation on the club more intimate conversations it's easier to post stuff thanks guys bye do you need more medical certification and business training learn more at www.cco.us